I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Now, this is the saints during the time of trouble. They will kill many. This is talking about mystery Babylon on the whole earth. This is talking about the time when the mark of the beast is enforced. This is talking about the time when Satan himself comes, he impersonates Christ, he claims to be God on earth, and he brings all the religions together, and he has his main puppets in lined all up, and they're all in harmony for a time, for a while, for a short while. God allows Satan to unite all the religions of earth together. And we'll see that in just a minute. But this is talking about those that he kills. And when I saw her, I was amazed. I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, do you know Daniel did the same thing in chapter 12? And in chapter 12, it says that the, that the enemy of God, the power of, of, of Satan, of darkness, will make war against them and will completely annihilate them. It's going to be a real dark time and we'll see more about that in chapter 18. But, but the angel said to me, why do you marvel? Why are you so in shock? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. Now, do you remember where the crowns were in chapter 13 on that beast that had seven heads and ten horns? How many of you remember? Raise your hand. Where? In, in chapter uh, 13. Where was it in chapter 12? It's the same beast in chapter 12. So since, let's just open the word, because it's always best to open the word and see where these crowns, the diadema, are. Charlie said ten horns, and he's right. So... In chapter 13, the beast coming up out of the pit after the head is being healed, not when the head is being will, healed. He's describing the beast that is coming up, and John says it had a head as though it had been wounded and was already healed when John is writing chapter 13, when he's describing chapter this beast. And it's right there in there. So the, the crowns, on the horns, I believe, as I understand it, represents political powers. After the Dark Ages, which is after the little horn power was wounded, during the 1800s, religion lost its hold on the human race. Secular, humanist, uh, atheistic governments began sweeping the earth. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, the religious leaders had very little say about how things were to be run. It shifted from the head. In chapter 12, this beast had the crowns on the head. Before the Renaissance, before coming out of the Dark Ages, the churches, control, the religions of the earth controlled people with a strong arm. But the people finally got fed up with it. And the churches were rejected as far as having political power. And, the, and the, uh, the church of the Dark Ages could no longer control the courts or the governments or the militaries or the police enforcement agencies of Europe. They lost their hold. They were deeply wounded. And now, even in China, the, the stronghold of Buddhism or Shintoism, and in India and places like that, the stronghold of Hinduism. Even in those areas, communistic, atheistic, political regimes took over. And they killed millions and tens of millions of people who would not bow to their secular, humanist, atheistic leadership. But that has changed, and it is changing very rapidly. And ever since... The wound was received in 1798, as we've studied, and ever since this wound has started to heal, they are once again seizing the political reins of planet Earth. This is serious business. But they will not seize it by themselves. They will, they will, you, they will uh, create a confederacy. Satan will do this. He will create a confederacy 
between the religious leaders and the political leaders. And in chapter 17, you find neither the heads or the horns wearing crowns. It's because in chapter 17, it's morphed and evolved into a shared church-state uh, conglomeration. Now, this only goes on for a short time. And, and we'll look more at that. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. Now, this is, uh, I believe, apocalyptic prophecy 404. So we're not going to talk about it here. We'll just stay with 101 here. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. We go over some of this on Wednesday night, but we don't have time and it would just all kind of get weird. So we're going to just get an introduction today. If your name is not written in the book of life by Jesus Christ, you will wonder after the beast. You will be enamored, you'll be overwhelmed. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now I know historically this fits the church of Europe, the church of Rome, the city of seven hills. But it also fits in the time of trouble. And the seven mountains are also seven kings, seven rulers. And I believe that the devil is going to bring them together. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. Now, I've heard about ten different theories about that, or proposals, and you can look those up, and I'm not going to add mine to it this morning, because it would take too long anyway. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. See, when this happens, this one that is not yet, he will continue a short time. I believe that's already been happening. And if you want to know more about that, you can call me or you can come Wednesday night or you can send me an email and I'll do my best to explain what I know. But we don't have time right here, right now. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth. Interesting to me that when the little horn came up in, in uh, 538 or 530s, in the 500 A.D. era, the little horn that came up destroyed how many horns of Daniel 2? Remember, how many horns did the little horn destroy? Three. And then how many horns are left now? Eight. Because there's seven left from the ten plus the little one. And he was the eighth. He became the eighth. I believe that many things we see in history that happened in Christendom during the Dark Ages... I believe that those, many, those same things will be repeated by Lucifer himself. And he will repeat it with the, with the seven world religions. And they're basically, you look it up, they have seven major world religions right now. That they, and, and I don't think, I don't know who came up with it, but it's all over the internet. And they've also divided the earth, these new world order people. You know, pre-President pre George Herbert Walker Bush, that's the older one, the first one, Pre-George Bush, you never heard anybody publicly admit the New World Order was coming into play. You know what? He was the first one that had the nerve to say it publicly. They've been working on it for a long time. A long time. But he was the first American leader that I ever heard of actually admit that they were establishing a new world order. And now you hear them all talking about it. They almost all talk about it. It's just sad, but, but they've come out of the closet, that's for sure. A lot more is coming. But they've divided the earth up into ten sections, these new world order people. Now somebody says, God's not going to let them have their way. Really? He's not? What book are you reading? He's going to let the devil have his way for a short time. We just read it a few minutes, a few minutes ago. Did it for a short period, for, for a little while. This time of trouble is going to be Satan's way. It sure isn't going to be, it sure isn't God's way. 
It's not God's way. What's going on right now? You've got little 8, 9, and 10-year-old Christian girls being kidnapped and treated in ways that I won't even repeat here by another religious group of people who have lost their minds. It's insanity. And if it hasn't hit you right here to the point where you don't pray and cry for these young Christians, let alone the older ones, but especially the children, they go right into the Christian schools and kidnap all the little girls and they kill all the little boys in the name of religion. And there's a whole discussion on that, and I know it's a big box, and I ain't jumping in. But we're in serious trouble here in this world. And it's not just over there, folks. It's already been happening here. And our government's been covering it up. And I'm talking about local, state, and federal governments have been covering this stuff up when it happens here. But it's starting to get out now. People are starting to get fed up and they're starting to expose how crazy things have been. And they're going to continue. And as you think about that, man, I'm telling you, you go to the park to play with your little children, you better be watching them like a hawk. Somebody says, where's your faith, Pastor Paul? I'll tell you where my faith is. If I'm a parent, I'm responsible. I mean, they got people running around grabbing little kids in parks. They'll run up to the monkey bars and grab your little kid and run off. And if you're not in shape, you're not going to catch them. You've heard of the worldwide child sex slave trade? It's a multi-billion dollar business. If you think we're not living in a time of serious, serious, sober time, we're already there. You got children or grandchildren, you are on duty. You're on alert. Because people have lost their minds. And I think even if I'm at the park and I see somebody grab somebody else's little kid, I better be running for all my big feet will go. And I better be running towards whoever that maniac is that grabs somebody's kid. If you think Christians are supposed to turn their other cheek when some maniac grabs somebody else's little kid, you don't have a clue. And if they fight me, they're in for a fight. If they hit me, I'll turn my cheek. They go after some little kid, ain't no cheek turning going on here. I hope you're man and woman enough to understand what I just said. You don't turn your cheek when the devil comes in and a predator starts inflicting danger and injury on children and women and elderly people, you don't say, oh, we got to turn our other cheek. That's ridiculous. I'll turn somebody's cheek. It won't be mine. And I hope my good buddy Tony D'April is with me when it happens. Because he's a kung fu master. I'll watch why he does it. Man, that guy can hurt you quick. One day, one day I, I told Tony, I said, Tony, you're a kung fu master? And he goes, yeah, 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 don't say that too loud. And I go, he goes, in fact, I'm a third degree kung fu master. I said, whoa. I said, well, show me some of your stuff, man. Well, I don't want to hurt you. I said, well, I know, but you can go easy on me, you know. And, and Tony's about that tall, you know, like a, built like a brick house, man. And I said, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab your shoulder like I'm going to try to get you. And show me what you would do. Okay, man. And man, I reached out to grab his shoulder, and that quick I was on the ground. And I was, and I was still under his control. He was still hurting me. It was not funny. And, and about, about three months later, I said, so let's try that again, Tony. It was worse that time. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being able to deal with some predator, you know. So... He's going to continue for just a short time. I'm so thankful for that. Aren't you thankful for that? The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth. 
and he is of the seven and is going to perdition, the lake of fire. The ten horns which you saw are the ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour, a short time, as kings of the whole earth with Babylon, mystery Babylon. And these people are so confident they're going to do this, they've already put it on the internet. They've already got the ten sections charted out, with how they're going to divide the earth up for their ten little rulers, puppet rulers. And, you know, I heard one of them say, you know, we are don't hide this anymore. One of these Illuminati, New World Order, take over the earth type people. They're religious, too. They, a lot of them publicly, openly worship Satan himself. Other ones don't. But they're saying, a lot of the movies you see in Hollywood, that's us. We're warning. We're, we're, we're in your face. We're telling everybody what we're going to do and try to stop us. A lot of these things you see in, in coming out in the movies, they're telling you what they're going to do. And they said, just try to stop us. Who wrote 1984? Was it George Orwell? Just because God slowed him down, slowed it down about 30 years, don't think it's not going to happen. It's already happened. Who was it that came out this last week? Was it uh, Samsung? Somebody came out from Samsung and said, if you've got a smart TV, don't say anything personal in front of that TV because they are watching you. Isn't that interesting? I'll say something personal. You need Jesus. <laughs> and if you come to my house, I know just where you can find him. I hope they're, I hope they're tapping my phone. That way they can hear when I'm praying with somebody. They can hear when someone's asking me questions about Jesus. And they can hear the humble, feeble answers I give, but it's, you know, Probably not what they're hearing on other wiretaps, phone taps. I couldn't care less. They, they've got, they claim they have laser beams now. They could, from the satellites, they can focus a laser beam on your living room window and they can hear everything you're saying. I hope they've got 10 of them connected to my house. So they can first of all see how weak I am and second of all see how great Jesus is. Amen? Amen? Amen. Why should we, people are worried about that. There's, a, there's plenty of other stuff to worry about. You don't need to be worried about that. Amen? Amen? I say bring them on. People are real nervous about Jesuit priests. I say send them all to Arlington. <laughs> Why not? Saul of Tarsus ended up being a pretty good Christian, didn't he? I say send them over here. We'll work with them. Amen. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. Jesus himself will come and defeat them. And the last time they try this, actually, the last time they try it, we looked at this a few weeks ago, is in chapter 16. They actually know, they see him coming, the three demons go out to the whole world to prepare the kings of the earth, and they think they're going to beat Jesus. They think they're going to be able to defeat him. Absolutely amazing that they think they could do that. Wow. But they won't. We can't lose. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot. For a short time they go along with her. Make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind. He puts it in their hearts to go along and support the harlot for a short time. We saw that. And to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. That is the gospel. When the gospel is finished, when the words of God have been completed, and probation closes. They will turn on this Babylon system and destroy it. Wow. But there's only a few days left after that because we know Jesus will come. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth, all the kings of the whole earth. It will happen. 
In Matthew, as we wrap this up quickly, Jesus, when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogues so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, the honor of God, Jesus, except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Unbelief will cheat you out of God's amazing grace. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump up to this. This is basically the same. So they, this is in Mark 6. So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country among his own relatives and in his own house. Now he could not, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. This is a Greek idiom that means he chose not to do anything there. It doesn't really mean he couldn't. We know he could because he healed a few people there. He had the power. So there was a few, Mark tells us something that Matthew didn't tell us. He did heal a few of them, but he chose not to heal any more there because of their unbelief. Jesus can work miracles no matter what. And I believe that. You remember Balaam? All he wanted to do was curse Israel, right? And every time he opened his mouth, all he did was bless Israel. That was a miracle. Because he was not wanting to. It's one of those rare times where God actually overruled the will of a human being. Now, he will never overrule the will of a human being when it comes to choosing whether to love God or reject God. He won't overrule that will. But if you're wanting to curse somebody and God doesn't want them cursed, there's not one thing you're going to be able to do to hurt them. And that's the same God that's going to be with us during the time of trouble. And no matter how bad they want to hurt you or or defy you or kill you, they will not be able to do anything to you unless they get permission from the living God, just like Lucifer did when he went and bargained over Job. And if God allows the devil to do something to you, it's only because it's the best thing that could ever happen to you. Now, we don't see it that way. We don't understand things that way. We don't like it either. I don't. You might, but I don't. But Romans 8.28 pretty well wraps this whole thing up and says, all good things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Is that what it says? No, it says all things. Even the bad things that happened to Job ended up for his education and for his maturing in the things of God. Hard way to learn it. I prefer the easy way, but most of the time I get it the hard way. I just hope I never have to go as far as Job went to learn about righteousness by faith. That's the heart of what's going on in Job. At the beginning, he's saying stuff like, well, I do this, and I do all that, and I help people, and I feed people, and I care of this people, and I do extra uh, sacrifices for my children in case they're sin. I don't know why this is happening to me. Look what all I do. At the end of the book, he ain't singing that song. The only song coming out of his mouth at the end of the book, there is no one righteous but Yahweh. He's not taking credit for anything. I say that's a good lead to follow. 
Amen? So the honor of God would not allow him to work miracles for the unbelievers because if he had done miracles for the unbelievers, it would have confirmed them in their unbelief. Now, it even gets more interesting with the scripture that we have on our, our bulletin today. The front of the bulletin, 1 Samuel 2.30. Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said, in, I said, past tense, indeed, that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. Now that's what God wants. That's what he wants people to do. That's the predestination of God. He predestines that everybody will be in heaven. He predestines that everybody will turn from their sins. We know that because it's in the New Testament. But it's also right here. But now, this is, what he, this is what I've said in the past, but now, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. Now, that's the honor of God. Those who respect me, I will respect. I will trust. There's a lot of trust in this word honor. Those who trust me, I will trust. There's a lot in there. That, that's a Hebrew word, and we only, English translators, use the word honor. But honor has trust in it. If you honor someone, that means you trust them. And if you trust me, God says, I'm going to trust you. But check this out. And those who despise me, shall be lightly esteemed. Now, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Now, I would consider this that, or I ask you to consider this, that Jesus said that God causes it to rain on the just, those who honor him, and the unjust, those who don't trust him, those who don't honor him. But he causes it to rain on them, right? And he lets them succeed, some of them succeed quite well in business or in employment or in you know, general human earthly uh, ventures. But they don't get heaven. They never are trusted by God. God never will trust them. Those who don't trust him will be lightly esteemed. Comparatively, relatively, getting to live 70 years down here even if you win an Olympic gold medal, even if you get a Super Bowl ring, even if you inherit, even not inherit, but even if you make $60 billion and own your own island with a $500 million house on it, compared to missing out on heaven, that is lightly esteemed. He still loves you. He'll still give you a lot of stuff to try to help you find him. But if you don't use it to find him, you'll be found using it to find destruction. That's lightly esteemed. Kind of like when Jesus said, he who teaches others to keep these commandments will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But he who teaches others to not obey the commandments will call least in the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what that means? That means you're gone. Because when the kingdom of heaven comes, there'll be two groups. The group that gets to live forever and enjoy everything God has, and the group that ceases to exist, that's least. Don't be fooled. It's not okay to be least in the kingdom of heaven. Because least in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about is you no longer exist. You've used up your 70 years, maybe 80, 90 maybe, and you get no more because I can't trust you. That's what God says. But if you trust me, I will trust you with my Holy Spirit. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I will trust you to help people around you. I will trust you to, to do things that only Jesus could do. Because if you trust in me, you will do the very works that I have done. That's what Jesus said. This is good news. And we just saw it in the book of Revelation. And God's going to do everything he can. He's going to give everybody every opportunity he can for them to turn and come to him. But finally, destruction will come. The good news is you can choose 
eternal life right now. And as we close, Jesus gave up everything for you. If you're the only sinner on planet earth, and there's a few other verses that we're not going to go through right now, but if you're the only sinner on planet earth, Jesus goes to the cross for you. Will you go to the cross for Jesus? He said, unless you take up the cross daily and come after me, Luke 9, you cannot be mine. We must take up the cross of Christ and be crucified with Christ every day. We must allow him to crucify us. I don't know how to take care. I don't know how to control my sinful nature, but I know somebody who does. Jesus. My mom couldn't. She tried. And she did as good a job as anybody I know of. But it doesn't finish the job, does it? Only Jesus from within. So I urge you, in fact, I beg you, if you do not have Jesus Christ living in you, before you leave this house of worship today, please just say, yes, Jesus. Come into my heart. Take charge of my life. And I will thank you forever.